If you use SMA providers in other aspects of your practice, I would argue there's never been a set of asset classes that would warrant using a third party more than digital. In 10 years, maybe a little bit different, right? People are more comfortable, more familiar. They might hire people in their practices that specialize in digital assets. And so, you know, my answer might change a little. But to try and do that on your own, I think is good luck is what I would say. Welcome, Model FAs. David DeSalle here, president of Model FA and your host of the Model FA podcast. And excited about our guest today. This is a topic that advisors are either fiending to talk about or they take a strong stance against it. So I'm really excited for our guest here today. And we actually connected on a couple fronts. So number one, Greg Johnson, he's speaking at the Riskalyze Fearless Conference here in a couple weeks recording. It'll be after the fact once it's released. And when we got on the phone, we realized that we have another connection as well. And I'll have to send this over to Dr. Hardiman once it's actually released. And some of the folks over at St. John's Prep found out we went to the same high school. So a fellow Eagles here. If there's any St. John's Prep alum that are listening to this podcast, let us know. But it's cool how really small the world is and similar backgrounds and ending up in similar industries as well. So Greg Johnson, he's the co-founder and CEO of Rubicon Crypto. And as I mentioned, Greg, I feel like I come across advisors who fit generally speaking two main categories and you know one is the advisor who's fiending to be able to include this in their client portfolios and they haven't really had a seamless way to do so where they're also able to build on the assets and then there's another camp of advisors that are anti crypto so excited to unpack that a little bit but before we actually get into the topic of crypto and how it can fit inside of a client's portfolio and their overall financial plan. I do want to set the stage, Greg, and just get a sense of your background. It helps set the stage for our audience and figure out kind of how you came up in the business. You know, obviously we had our intro call already, but you know, advisors will be curious. Are you a crypto guy trying to come into the industry? Did you grow up in the industry and come across, you know, crypto and want to bring it in? Help us understand how you grew up in the business. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And it's great to be with you. And congratulations on all the success you guys have been able to generate with the podcast series and elsewhere, David. But uh, Appreciate it. my story is uh, I was plucked from what was going to be a career in law uh, to, into financial services when I was 22. And uh, right after undergrad, I found myself uh, very fortunately in the right industry at the right time at the right place. And you know, in 1990, I signed up with American Express Advisors in Boston, Massachusetts at a time when you most got people... you got your career started, Greg. Sorry to interject. The same year in which I was born. I, yeah, thank you. For that. Yeah, thank you. Anytime I have the opportunity, I always toss a dig when yeah, someone I thought, brings I thought up. We were going to wait until we got 33 minutes into this <laughs> thing before you were going to do that. But but thank you. No, but uh, that boy, that is something. But in all seriousness, at that time in 1990, nobody was talking about fee-based planning. Nobody was talking about comprehensive planning other than American Express. And of course, the rest of the industry has caught up and we've seen many other evolutions. But I spent 10 years in private practice, David, as a CFP practitioner. I actually found out after the fact I might have been the youngest CFP in the country for about two weeks. I would have marketed the heck out of that if I'd known about it. But you know, the culture was steeped in CFP back then, uh, an incredibly fertile training ground, you know, American Express advisors in those days. And then after 10 years, I sold my practice and then I was involved in progressively larger executive roles at American Express before, during and after the spinoff to Ameriprise. Probably my biggest claim to fame while I was there was I ran the pilot that was ultimately rolled out enterprise wide that merged the payments business, in other words, platinum, gold, centurion cards with wealth management. And just an incredibly rewarding career for 25 years. Took a sabbatical and did an MBA and tried to do anything but financial services for a while. This was right after the crisis. And ultimately, I was brought back into digital assets by some people that I very much respected from the traditional finance world. And they said, hey, we think we've come up with something to try and connect the dots between the traditional you know, financial planning and financial advisory world and this crazy digital assets and crypto space. 
would you give us your thoughts? And here we are having a conversation on your podcast. So you kind of know how that story ended. I became fascinated, have been involved in blockchain and crypto for six, seven years. And I really saw that there was a way to help advisors unpack the dilemma that they find themselves in that you kind of outlined already. Awesome. With my personal Amex cards, any added benefits by knowing someone that worked there for a number of years or am I stuck with what I got? None, none whatsoever. <laughs> In fact, it may be a distraction. You never know. Um, Although I will say this, I will say this, you probably only use about, if surveys are still true, maybe you use 10% of the benefits for your card that you have available to you. It's amazing how many People that work for corporations don't even understand all the affinity programs that they have. And at Amex, they've done a better job lately, but man, people don't fully take advantage of all the stuff they're paying for. Yeah, I try with when they roll out, I think it's monthly, their monthly emails about, hey, this month's perks and I'm using all the Uber and the Uber Eats and the airline yeah. lounges and airline credits. So yeah. hopefully I'm a, a little bit more than the 10%, but I try my best in those emails to figure out what the benefits are without also being tricked into spending more money than I otherwise would have. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Greg, let's start with the topic. Again, the two camps of advisors, the ones who are like, hey, we need a solution to be able to help our clients get exposure to this industry. And then the advisors who are, you know, hey, this shouldn't be considered in any way, shape or form for our clients. So let's speak to those people first, the ones who are anti-crypto as it relates to financial planning. How should those advisors or how would you suggest those advisors be thinking yeah. about crypto as it relates to including it? For their clients? You know, the, the first thing I would say, it's a terrific question. It's a basic question. I think that the answer is quite nuanced, though. And what I mean by that is I think within the end of this decade, there's going to be largely one camp, and there's just going to be some fringe people outside of the camp, to be honest with you. We're already seeing uh, the migration of traditional financial players uh, to digital. And then people are just going to wake up one day and be like, oh my gosh, everybody's doing it and wondering you know, what happens. So this is underway as we speak right now. But for those folks that are, that are skeptical, there's good reason for them. And I understand that skepticism. I truly do. And I think one of the things that we saw as an opportunity to add value was to really create a business model that was grounded with rational exuberance. And yes, that is a pun on the irrational exuberance quote from Greenspan back in 96, which I believe was probably before you were born too or whatever, but uh, you get the idea. I was learning how to read, Greg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you know uh, it's it's one of those things where we find that there's been so much nonsense in the industry, like any nascent industry, David, you find that there's no shortage of people that are charlatans. There's no shortage of people that are scam artists. And we have that in crypto. As a matter of fact, of the 10,000 plus crypto projects, coins, tokens, the whole ecosystem, honestly, I would say about 85% of it is garbage. And so we really try to laser in on what is the future? What are the use cases that are just common sense? I guess what I would say to those that are having a hard time wrapping around the concept of digital assets and crypto in general is to kind of look at the signs, the signs that are hiding in plain sight. We talked about this in our prep call, but I don't think you need to you know, wear night vision goggles to see what's going on big picture in the industry. I don't think you need a Pokemon Go app to see where everything is. The reality is whether or not it's Berkshire Hathaway, whether or not it's uh, JP Morgan Chase, whether it's Black, you get the idea. All of the major institutional players are quietly and not so quietly gearing up for what we believe at Rubicon Crypto will be the greatest reallocation of wealth in the history of the industry. And I know there are some institutions that believe it'll be as much as 10% of the over 100 and 110 trillion of assets under management in the wealth management space in the US. And we think by the end of this decade, at least 2% of that finds its way across the spectrum into digital assets. So I think I understand why there is such a hard time. The other thing is it involves a suite of uh, technical skills. It involves effort. Let's face it, a lot of successful advisors are in, in uh, cruise control mode. And when you start getting involved with digital assets, 
it does require you to roll up the sleeves a little bit in order to feel comfortable that you know what you're talking about. And and we've identified that as a problem and some friction in the industry, and we're trying to help with that too. I think one of the hurdles with the adoption by advisors is one of the first steps, which is just education around this arena. Do you guys provide education like that? Or are there resources that you can point folks to to educate themselves in this space? Because obviously, if they're not understanding it, they can't talk about it with their clients. So where do they start with the education? It's almost too much education at this point in time. The answer is the short answer is yes, we do that. It's a big part of our value prop. And when we partner with an RIA, we partner with the financial advisors, what we say that we believe and we're finding is quite compelling is that if you go deep with us, you can use us from an education standpoint with your clients, prospects, and COIs to such an extent that you're not going to reallocate your AUM just to reposition what you already have. But when you leverage our ability to educate consumers and your team, you're going to be able to grow your practice organically, new clients under management, new AUM to be brought over, not just cannibalizing what you already have and you know reallocating your pie. What we're finding is one of the very few topics today, even in the midst of this crypto winter that everyone likes to call it, right? This downturn in the market. One of the few subjects that actually puts butts in seats, whether it's from uh, virtual or in person, it's not going to be Medicare open enrollment, right? It's going to be, you know, it's not going to be an annuitization seminar or dinner, private dining event. But if you're talking about digital assets, if you're talking about those topics, people are fascinated by it. And the other thing I would say to the detractors or the late comers to this party, if you will, is that um, the clients don't really care if you're involved or not. The number of people that have bypassed their advisors to get involved, rightly or wrongly, into a crypto, you know, almost as if they're behaving like adolescents, you know, sneaking in the alley for a smoke or a beer without telling their advisor or CPA to invest in crypto because they didn't want to feel silly, they didn't want to be chastised, or they thought that the advisor was indifferent. It's a staggering number. And while that may have cooled off a little bit, you know when the market goes in the other direction, when it starts to steady itself and start to move forward again, you're going to see that trend repeat itself. So we think there's an incredible opportunity for advisors to acknowledge that even if they don't want to personally advocate for digital assets in their portfolio allocation, They have to have something to say, and they have to know how to say it. Uh, Now, back to your question, I would say there's a couple of really good places. If you want to go someplace that I think is really a terrific source, MIT Sloan's open source course taught by Gary Gensler. A lot of people have heard of it. Gary Gensler, of course, is our head of the SEC. He actually did what I thought was one of the best basic curriculums on the technologies, it's an MIT Sloan course, so it can get very techy. But that's a place that if you really want to dig in is a good start. And then after that, there's so much content. And we're proud to have contributed to that sea of content ourselves at Rubicon. Awesome. Now, going back to the two camps, call them optimists and pessimists, yeah. depending on if we're in a, a bull market in crypto or the crypto winter, as you put it, I think there's two things that happen. One is... You hear people say, see, I told you, you know, and that can go in either direction. And then you have people who kind of switch camps along the way. Either direction. Yeah. Yeah. How do you suggest that advisors kind of manage their emotions or expectations through the volatile times that we see? Because even though the stock market is volatile currently, it tends to be more steady over time than how people perceive the crypto space in what I would say is still its infancy. So how should advisors be managing their emotions uh, and expectations throughout the journey? Well, you know, you said a couple of key words in that that lead into the question, perception, perceive. You know, the volatility, first of all, what's funny is I spent 10 years in private practice getting really good at being able to gather all of a client's wealth, manage all of their insurance, manage the whole thing. And then I spent 15 years being pretty good at training and developing advisors to do the same thing. And to answer your question, now I'm really good at, you know, giving the Heisman Trophy stiff arm and basically saying, no, you can only allocate 
2%, 3% of your overall portfolio into the space. I think that the way that you manage the expectations is being completely candid and being rational about the expectations that you're setting with clients or for yourself for that matter. We believe that the future of business, of finance is digital. And we could have an entire series of podcasts on why that's the case. The reality is we continue to move away from analog and into digital. I believe that today, maybe 5% of the products in the digital asset and crypto world exist compared to what will be around at the end of this decade. You said infancy. I couldn't agree with that even more. So with that in mind, what we try to say to people is the following. If I was your financial advisor in 97 and I said to you, hey, David, listen, I want you to throw a little bit of money into something that I've been looking at. It's this company. It's going to be named after a river in South America. They're going to sell books on the computer. You know, it seems like a good idea. You know, you should do it. And you said yes. So what are the chances are you like the fact that I put you into Amazon back in 97 when it first popped, right? And so everyone's hand goes up if I do that in a seminar or a conference or something like that when I tell this narrative. The reality is, is that for 13 years, my allocation for you into Amazon was the reason you either heckled me, teased me, or wanted to fire me because it did nothing. And then it did a lot. And so we often talk, we've gotten away in the industry I think from really holding true and being really tough with clients about setting expectations. So we talk about digital assets as being not long-term, but longest term. And I think when you have the right perspective on that, and then you tell people, by the way, David, this will be not a volatile, but it's going to be the most volatile allocation you've had, which is why I'm not telling you to put 20% of your portfolio into it. And that's why I'm saying only two to 3%. This is what's missing from the narrative in the industry, in our view. What's missing is people, you know, taking that early stage approach. Uh, We are not crypto maximalists at Rubicon Crypto. We're, We're realists. We see where the future is going. It is clear that's where we're headed. And we think an allocation for people that are investing in equities of two to three percent is a standard recommendation, period, Uh, if you have the longest term kind of a mindset. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but that's the first way I would try to answer your question. No, understood. And going back to a word that you use or or a situation that you shared regarding uh, crypto and all the various projects in their current state, um, I think you said 85% of them by and large are garbage and won't be around long term. And that can be worrisome and intimidating for advisors. Like, what if I pick one of those 85%? How do advisors sift through the noise and the garbage to find that diamond? Partner with us is is the short answer Hmm. or another quality vendor in the space. In all seriousness, when you think about if you use SMA providers and other aspects of your practice, I would argue there's never been a set of asset classes that would warrant using a third party more than digital. In 10 years, maybe a little bit different, right? People are more comfortable, more familiar. They might hire people in their practices that specialize in digital assets. And so, you know, my answer might change a little bit. But to try and do that on your own, I think is good luck is what I would say. We're 100 hours a week into this. Mm. You know, everybody that's on the Rubicon team for sure. And to answer your question about how do we try and sort that out, one of the main decisions that we made was to partner with Gemini, which is one of the few crypto exchanges that is a US-based exchange. But more importantly, they're a New York-based crypto exchange. And perhaps even more importantly, they are uh, formed as a trust entity. And not to get too regulatory yet, I know we're going to talk about that subject, But the fact that Gemini actually is formed as a trust entity was very comforting to us because there are questions that are abounding now about other exchanges like Coinbase and others. And I don't think Coinbase, they're not going to go bankrupt. But if they did, you know, a client's crypto is gone, right? It's forfeited. You know, when you have a trust entity, those assets are segregated. So that was one of the things that we looked at. But to answer the question more specifically... Uh, what we liked about Gemini was they don't list every Tom, Dick, and you know shitcoin if I can or on a podcast. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to say it, but yeah, yeah, there you have it. <laughs> so they have just a little over a hundred plus projects that are on their exchange. 
And that doesn't guarantee they're all going to be successful, but they've done at least a reasonable amount of due diligence on the liquidity side. So projects that should be able to satisfy some degree of liquidity stress testing, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's kind of one of the first layers of due diligence that we do. And then at the end of the day, what we're trying to figure out is, uh, you know, what are the use cases that are practical, that make sense, that, you know, a equity analyst, you know, looking at stocks would value the same types of attributes in a, you know, crypto project. And these are the types of things that you do. You know, 70% of the way that you pick crypto is the same as the way you pick a stock. It's that last 30% that we think we're onto something with our modeling and the algorithmic work that we're doing for our portfolios. But the reality is that work still is being refined. And that's what's new about this space more than anything else. But, you know, the basics are there. What's the leadership team look like? What is the use case that you're trying to solve for? You know, what's the capitalization, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The thing that really is different in this space is something called tokenomics, which ultimately can be a very tricky side of valuating the potential of a project. And that's what we spend our time focusing on for folks. You, know, you mentioned regulatory, Greg, if I'm an advisor and I want to integrate this into my business, are there any regulatory considerations or changes that I need to make on my end or by linking up with someone like you that's taken care of? Like, What are the hurdles to integrate this? The first part would be, look, if you're a registered investment advisor and you are a pure RIA and you are truly a fiduciary, you know the answer already. You have the ability to do due diligence. You do your due diligence and you can make recommendations you feel are in the best interest of your client, knowing your client base. And so you can work with us directly right now. If you're a hybrid or you're a broker dealer advisor, you are still reliant upon the organization's compliance and what they say goes, right? Like who's on their grid, who can participate and who can't. The broader regulatory question, David, is one. I'm actually going to be in D.C. next week speaking for the Bretton Woods Committee at the IMF annual meetings and talking about, guess what, regulatory issues in crypto, okay? And in the United States right now, one of the things that's good about our regulatory system that has provided by far and away the best financial markets, capital markets environment in the world, and will continue to be that way, is we have multiple regulatory agencies involved in managing, you know, this incredibly robust financial market system. But right now, that is working against us from the standpoint of getting clarity in crypto regulation. So you have the SEC, the CFTC, you even have a number of the other lesser known agencies that are all duking it out for primacy about who gets to regulate this. At the end of the day, what we believe at Rubicon Crypto is most of the crypto and token projects that are out there, they kind of look and feel like securities, right? They kind of behave like a stock, if you will, in many respects. I know there are purists in the industry that would be taking substantial umbrage with me for making such a statement. But the reality is that's how they behave. That's how they look and they feel. At the end of the day, this crypto winter, this depression in the market, has accelerated the regulatory scrutiny that ironically is going to bring all financial advisors into the mix. All firms, every broker dealer before this decade is over, and we believe probably by 2026, every major broker dealer will also be having crypto and digital asset solutions available for their advisors. I think that forecast would have been a few years later had we not seen, ironically, this decline in the marketplace. And that has brought the regulatory focus, the eye of Sauron, if you will, has been squarely on crypto and digital. And it's going to lead to, I think, an acceleration of adoption in the United States that's right around the corner. And we believe that that really starts opening up towards the end of 2024 and into 2025. Now, if my understanding is correct, Greg, you know, one of the value props in crypto is the idea that it's you know decentralized as well as fees are limited right anyone can participate without that hurdle so 
how do advisors have the conversation around, let me do this for you and charge you a fee when it kind of, again, if my understanding is correct, goes against one of the purposes of crypto? How do they handle that style conversation? Or am I asking the question wrong? I don't know that you're asking the question wrong. I think you got one part of it 100% right. And then the other part of it maybe is a little bit of gray. So for sure, it's decentralized. You know, one of the things that's fascinating, Dave, we talked about this again in the prep discussion, is the number of ironies that abound, right? The crypto industry, as we describe it today, we're in October at the time of this recording. You know, it was uh, Halloween of 2009 when the first white paper about Bitcoin was first released by our friend Satoshi. And the whole premise of that was in response to the utter failings of the establishment financial world that almost led to the absolute collapse of the financial system. And it's now 15 years almost removed from the start of that crisis. And so it's way in our foggy memory. It was devastating. It was nothing like some of the economic hardship many Americans are facing right now and advisors are having to deal with right now, not even close. And the irony is the entire premise behind crypto is all decentralized. In other words, we have kind of like $6 million man, Steve Austin, for the older viewers, but it's kind of like we have the technology. We can do this without institutions. We don't need third parties to validate the exchange of value between one party and another. The cryptography is strong enough. The breadth of the networks is large enough. The computer networks, there's enough people out there in order for this to work. That was the catalyst for the industry. And then ironically today, you see almost every government in the world working to use blockchain technologies to create central bank digital currencies. Again, a subject I'll talk about next week in DC, but my goodness, that is as ironic as it gets. As far as the fees are concerned, what we did is we created Rubicon Crypto for SMA solutions. We wanted products and digital assets that advisors were already comfortable with using, that clients were already comfortable with having in their portfolios, but also firms were comfortable with supervising. So our model is plug and play into the way that most advisors already run their practices right now. And let's just say I'm an advisor, the average fee for managing client assets, just call it 1% for easy math. How is that split up between the advisor and a company like yours? Well, it's higher. You know, when you're in emerging, you know, kind of asset classes, the fees for assets under management are going to be higher. So for what we do when we work as a sub-advisor to any financial advisor, we charge, you know, 1.25% and the advisor will bill on top of that. Typically, they'll do another 100 basis points or 75 bips. To keep that around 2%, we kind of go from there. When you think about what Rubicon is bringing, we're actually bringing essentially what most digital asset hedge funds provide, but without the performance fees. So some advisors may not be familiar with how hedge funds kind of charge for fees, but they basically have a 2 and 20 model. They charge 2% fee no matter what, and then they'll charge a 20% performance fee, which means they skim 20% off of any of the positive results that they generate. So that's pretty significant. And obviously, that wouldn't go through a lot of compliance for broad adoption. We want broad adoption. So the way we manage our portfolios is very similar to how a hedge fund manages the portfolio. We just don't charge that performance fee. We think we've got a very vibrant model without having to do that. Now, one of my final questions, because I think as we're talking, Greg, this is a good part one podcast. I think there should be a part two and beyond as well. And it'll be cool to see kind of how the industry changes, you know, every episode that we do. But does an advisor have the option, let's say they say, hey, I just want to, you know, go into say Bitcoin, or I just want to go into Ethereum. Do they have the option to do that? Or is it more of and I'm using a word that probably doesn't apply, but to get the point across, is it more of like an ETF style compilation of the 15% that are not garbage? How does that work logistically? So the answer is it depends. If it's a very large account, you know, one of the things with SMA is you have the ability to bespoke, right? So we can curate a very specific kind of a portfolio for 
Let's assume we are partnering with an RIA that wants to put several million dollars into digital assets, but they say, we somehow, we think everything but Bitcoin is great. We want no Bitcoin. So we want an allocation without Bitcoin. So we can customize unless we have a really philosophical problem for that request. But for the most part, we have two portfolios that have very specific objectives. One is an entry-level portfolio that has about seven to as many as nine digital assets in them. Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two largest, and they are also the largest holdings in that first portfolio called Brooklyn Bridge. And then we have our Golden Gate Bridge portfolio, which is all involved in what many people may be familiar with, which is called Web3 technologies, metaverse technologies. And you know, one of the things that's kind of cool about if for advisors going back to your opening question again, David, real quickly, and they wonder, well, where's the meat here? How can this be worth anything? What is the future of this industry? There's also a big allocation in that portfolio into what are called decentralized applications. So back around 2007 or six, when we didn't have a lot of these smartphones, you know, Apple used to run the commercials that said, there's an app for that. There's an app for this. There's an app for that. What people don't understand as universally yet is that these major blockchains are seeing developers build on top of those operating systems, just like a mobile phone. And we think some of the projects that are being developed on those blockchains that are still in token form are very exciting. And so we allocate there. So we're not doing an index allocation. We do active management, you know, and so we are largely long, but we're not stupidly long, if that makes any sense. Cool. Well, Greg, this has been incredibly insightful. I also think that it's been, how should I put it, inviting to those who may be skeptics. It wasn't a, you know, you have to do this, you're dumb if you don't type of vibe. And I think you positioned it very well. And I do truly believe that this is a fantastic part one. And I would like to have you back on to talk about it in more depth. That'd be our pleasure. But before we do wrap up, I do want to pivot slightly. So one thing that we do with all of our guests as a way to distill a reading list for folks is talk about a book that's had an impact on them. And I know we talked briefly about Mastery by George Leonard. Why'd you pick that book? What's the impact that it had on you? You know, I wished I read the book earlier in my life, but it was given to me by a mentor and I've used it to teach professional development classes quite a bit on the book. If I was going to give you the New York Times one sentence book review is that people need to embrace the plateaus in their lives. In other words, you know, as a younger gentleman, when I was, you know, building my practice and just focused on next, 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 I don't know that I fully embraced the plateaus that I was in at times, that I took full advantage of some of those opportunities. And I think what Leonard does in Mastery is not only give a roadmap for success, but he also kind of, for me at least, showed ways that, you know, moving forward in my life, I could be more present. And I could take advantage of different places in my life by staying present. And it's a terrific read. It's a East Coast, West Coast flight book. So you can polish it off from flying from Tampa to LA if you're doing that. Or Tampa to Utah here in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's right. Actually, you can pick it off. It's a small book. It's a small book. So you can definitely do that. Yeah, no doubt. Love it. Well, Greg, if I'm an advisor and you have me intrigued or you have confirmed what I've been thinking sure. and I want to learn more. Where can people find you? Where can they access some of the resources that you alluded to earlier on in this conversation? Where do I go? All roads lead to the website, of course, nowadays. So it's rubiconcrypto.com. And there's tremendous resources that explore the dilemma that advisors are facing, how to educate clients, and you'll see the full suite of our education content as well that's there. You can also reach me at greg at rubiconcrypto.com if you want to reach out to me directly and send me an email. Awesome. Well, Greg, it's a pleasure chatting with you. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person here in a couple of weeks. For everyone who's listening, we're trying really hard to bring new and different topics to the podcast. And I think that this episode checks the box really well. So let us know what you think. Would love it if you shared the episode with some of your peers get some more eyes and ears on the show and appreciate your attention today. Greg, thanks for joining. Thank you.